Hello and welcome. My name is Waldo, and in this video, we're going to be doing some more work on Dyno, my 1978 Dynaho 160 Series 3 tractor loader backhoe. In a recent video, I resealed this hydraulic cylinder for this stabilizer right here. And while that was successful, I found that the stabilizer arm would still fall down all on its own. It wouldn't stay upright. When it falls down, you can actually hear a leaking sound coming from the hydraulic control valve right here. And that tells me that I have some internal leaking. Now, I've long suspected that there has been leaking coming from the valves. I don't know if you saw the video where I replaced the seals on the boom cylinder, but when I was trying to remove the rod and the piston, I decided that it would be a good idea to use the hydraulics to push the piston out. And I was actually operating the valve for the dipper to extend the dipper. And for some reason, even though I wasn't touching the boom valve at all, the boom cylinder shot out because for some reason, pressurized fluid was making its way into the cylinder. And that was a big hint that something's wrong internally. So the plan is, I'm gonna to try to remove this unit right here. It has tons of hydraulic lines connected to it, so it might be a little tricky to remove, but I'm gonna remove this, take it apart. There's probably O-rings or something like that inside that are all old and nasty and need to be replaced. And hopefully it shouldn't be too hard of a rebuild. So let's get to work. All right, I think I have this thing completely unbolted and all the lines are undone. Now, I don't know how heavy this thing is, but it does look like a big chunk of metal, so it, I think it's gonna be fairly heavy. And I'm just gonna try to lift it out and back because these lines are still physically here, even though they're disconnected, so it's kind of gotta come out that way in through the cab. Yeah, it's heavy, but it's it's liftable. I think I gotta remove the seat from in here so I can get this thing out. It's just in the way. A little while later. <sighs> the next day. So I didn't end up filming it because, well, it kind of got dark and I also sort of forgot to, but anyway, I got this thing down here into the workshop, so I'm going to try to disassemble it. Now the block of hydraulic control valves is attached to this backing plate, and it does sort of restrict my access to the bottom part of it, although I still have decent access to the top here. I would remove this from the backing plate, but it's got these lines up here. Uh, that are connected through the backing plate, and it's kind of a puzzle, so I think I'm going to try to do this without removing it, and I may end up removing it later if I have to. So I guess the first thing for me to do is to probably label these so that I get them back in the right order, and then uh, I'm going to uh, disassemble this, and then there's some really big flathead bolts, uh, bolts that take a flathead screwdriver that are holding on these plates for each uh, valve. So I'll pull those off and then see if I can pull out the uh, spools. All 
Alright, I've got the biggest flathead bit I have, so let's see if this is uh, big enough to get these bolts out. I do not know how much torque this is supposed to take. Oh, yo, excellent. I just so happened to choose the one that is the stabilizer on the right side, which is the one that I know I heard the leaking from, so I guess if I do this first, then uh, we'll be able to get right to the problem valve, although I, I suspect probably many of them have problems, but this may be the worst. Yeah, there's definitely something in here that forms some sort of a seal. I wonder if I need to undo the bottom part. Well, if I try the one on the end here, I know I can access the bottom part of this one on the end because this plate is not in the way, so uh, maybe I should try this one first. Be why it won't come off. So there's a spring here and uh, yeah it looks like I just gotta pull this thing apart. The good news is that I know how to take it apart. The bad news is that I'm gonna have to remove this block from the backing plate. Now that I have the backing plate out of the way, I really want to get this right stabilizer valve out so that I can see what's wrong with it. Alright, so I disconnected the lever from the other end of this and I think it should just slide right out. And there it is. Okay, so here's the spool. There's some amount of wear on it, although it doesn't actually look like it's too much wear, I think. But uh, I do see there is a seal here, which is very old. We'll take a look inside and see what we're dealing with. These are the holes from which I removed the spools. And inside, you can actually see that there are eight different chambers that make up the valve. So I made this animation to help show how the valve works internally. The dark gray represents the valve body, while the light gray represents the spool. The high pressure hydraulic fluid is delivered to all six valves through a channel in the center labeled P. The red color shows the movement of the fluid under pressure. The ports labeled A and B are connected to a hydraulic cylinder. The ports labeled T return fluid to the hydraulic tank. When the spool is moved to one side, in this case to the right, it allows the pressurized fluid to travel through the A port to the hydraulic cylinder. As the hydraulic cylinder either extends or retracts, it pushes hydraulic fluid out of its other port to the B port of the valve body. Notice that the spool also connects the B port with the T port, which allows the hydraulic fluid to return to the hydraulic reservoir. At this time, I have not figured out what the two center chambers are used for, so if you have an idea, leave a comment down below. I managed to get all of the spools removed from the valve body. The two spools in the middle are for the outriggers, the stabilizers, and the four on the outside, those are for the backhoe itself. Uh, the spools for the stabilizer cylinder are a little bit different from the other ones. The primary difference is that the lands on the end are actually, uh, they're smaller than the ones on this side. Not smaller in diameter, but more like smaller in length or width, I suppose. This angle from the side better illustrates the difference. 
you see this is a stabilizer spool and this is a spool for the, I don't know, for the boom cylinder, I think. And you can see that this distance here is smaller than this. You can also see that this land sticks out maybe a little bit farther than this one. You might not actually be able to see. And then this land here sticks out a lot farther than this one does. So many of the edges of the lands have these little indentations. And what this is for is for feathering. When you slowly open the valve, this actually lets a small amount of fluid through at the beginning, and that allows you to feather the valve. So you can have just a small amount of hydraulic force put onto the cylinder. Uh, it lets you use it much more smoothly and have better control over it. Now, many of the edges of the lands have these. So uh, on the boom cylinder spool, it has it for every single edge. For the stabilizer cylinder spool, however, it only has it for these two edges and these two edges here. Now, if you look at the lands in the center here, uh, on all of these spools, they actually have these little grooves cut in them. And what that does is when fluid tries to pass through, because this is a, it, it's a very tight, uh, finely machined fit in the valve body. So a very small amount of fluid is able to get through. But what this does is it sort of causes almost like an eddy current and it actually helps prevent fluid from leaking through. So that helps provide a better seal. So if we start out by focusing in on the lands of the spool for the boom cylinder, you can actually see that there are a bunch of little scratches in the land itself. Now this spool is still a tight fit in the valve body, so it's not a huge deal. It's not gonna prevent it from operating properly, but it will cause fluid to leak through there, more fluid than is really supposed to. Now focused in on this spool for one of the stabilizer cylinders, you can see that it also has some of those scratches in it, although this one in particular has a lot of scratches on the very end there. Both stabilizer cylinders have that same wear pattern. After taking apart the valve body and inspecting this wear and the rest of the valve body as well, uh, I think that the wear on these spools is what's causing the leaking inside the valves. All right, so the plan is to reassemble this and put it back into service. As I reassemble it, I'll be replacing dozens of O-rings and that'll help to keep some things from leaking. Unfortunately, I am going to have to deal with the valves leaking at the spools. That means that the stabilizers will probably drift down on their own, although because the stabilizers in particular, they have a pilot-operated check valve. So that means that when they're in the down position, they actually will hold the machine in place and they won't drift upwards. As for the backhoe itself, I didn't notice any significant leaking in the valves, so that should be usable. Now, before I finish reassembling this, I want to address one last issue. And that issue is, these control levers have an awful lot of slop in them. That slop is primarily caused by the linkage in between the spool and the lever itself. Let's take a closer look. So we have the lever itself, and there's a clevis pin which connects the lever to a clevis. The clevis is attached to this uh, eye bolt here, which is threaded in and secured by a hex nut. And then there's another clevis pin, which secures the eye bolt to the spool. And you can just see how much play there is. Now, most of the play is actually up here uh, in between the lever and this clevis pin, but we're gonna be replacing the whole assembly just for good measure. 
So here are the components I ordered for the linkage. Uh, so what's notable is the eye bolt. They didn't have the exact right size that I needed. So I ordered one that doesn't have threads and doesn't have the hole drilled. Let me flip this over here. Uh, it does have a pilot hole, so I'll be able to drill the right size hole here and I'll be able to cut the size threads that I need. In this case, it's 5 16 fine thread. And then the other thing, I have a bearing here. This is a uh, an oiled bronze bearing. And what I'm gonna do is uh, drill out the hole that's on the lever because this is all wallowed out. That actually probably gives it the most most of the play. Um, I'm gonna drill that out and then I'll press in the bronze bearing and that'll tighten this up. And if I ever have to replace this because it's worn out again, I'll just be able to easily replace the bronze bearing. We'll start by machining this eye bolt. First, I'll drill a 3 8 hole. Doesn't have to be perfect, but would like it to be close. And there we go. <laughs> the hole's not perfectly centered, but it's close enough. With six of those made up, let's cut some threads in these. All right, so I'm gonna be using my Harbor Freight tap and die set. I got a 5 16 fine thread. That's 24 threads per inch. And let's see if this works. Try to get it on here straight. So you spin this up, and if you're looking inside, you can sort of see uh, little pieces of uh, steel start to curl up. You occasionally want to go backwards just to break those off. If you can't see, you can hear them like that, a little clicking noise. I'm not sure if that'll pick up on my lapel mic. Yeah, I should probably use some uh, cutting oil on this for lubrication. And look at that, we've got some nice beautiful threads. Nice 3 8 hole. It's ready to go. So we've got five more of these to do. So I forgot to film this part, but I already drilled out the hole here, the one that was all wallowed out. And I drilled it out to 3 8 inch because that's the OD of this brass bearing. And then the ID is 5 16 of an inch. So this should just fit right in here. And it's not a press fit, but it is a nice snug fit. <sighs> Which is good. And there it is. I got this thing ground down so that it fits uh, somewhat flush on both sides. And then the 5 16 clevis pin fits in, and there's almost no play. It fits in really well. So we'll, that'll get the slop out of this. I just finished putting these levers and linkages back together, and uh, the result is pretty good. There's, you know, obviously there's still a little bit of play, but this is hugely improved over the way it was. So now let's get this thing installed back into the backhoe. So we're going to see if I can get this thing a bit higher up so that it clears the um, that bar behind me. That might be good enough.
All right, well, that's just about in place. I just got to bolt this thing down, connect all these lines. Oh, I, I have to replace the seals on this thing too. Those did come in. One hour later. So I just finished getting this thing bolted in place and uh, all the lines hooked up. Uh, some of these steel lines, it's like a puzzle trying to get them all in because some of them, especially this one back here, have really limited access. It's like, you know, you're turning the wrench a twelfth of a turn, flipping it around, that kind of thing. And even then, it's like you're barely gripping onto it. It's pretty crazy, but uh, so that's all hooked up. The last hose I need to do is this big one here, but this one has this sort of uh, almost like a swivel joint. And I'm going to replace the O-rings and seals on this. I already removed the O-rings from these, but uh, it's, it still does have two backup rings. I'm not going to replace the backup rings because these seem like they're in good shape. So it has two regular O-rings like this that go on the very ends. And in the middle here, here and here, there are two X-profile O-rings. And then I just want to make sure this O-ring isn't all twisted. Be really careful with your pick so that you don't damage the O-ring itself. I'm like playing with fire here. <clears throat> and that looks good. And we'll top it off with another O-ring. And I'll just lubricate these O-rings with some Vaseline. Doesn't really matter what you use. Some people say to use Vaseline because it, uh, you know, it won't ruin rubber, but these O-rings are actually made, they're Buna N O-rings, um, nitrile, so they're pretty oil resistant, and obviously they're meant to seal against oil, so it's definitely okay if they're exposed to oil. Just slides on. It's a much tighter fit now with those X-profile O-rings. The old ones were really worn out. Oh, come on. Oh my goodness. Oh, That's why. Just ruined the backup ring. Yeah, I don't know. Somehow I ruined the backup ring, so I guess I'm just gonna have to order one of these and replace that. So while I'm waiting for those new backup rings to come in, I can install this fiberglass sort of housing for this unit. And that's important because this has the throttle. It just slides right on, but I have to unscrew these first, these knobs. I might need to snake this throttle cable in there before I can actually get this in place. If you can see that but it's actually snowing a little bit so the throttle is kind of a pain to hook up getting it out was a pain there was a lot of swearing involved and i don't want to film that so uh, i think i'm going to do it the easy way and while i'm at it i'm also going to do the knobs the easy way too because why not so here here goes nothing and with that i guess we just got to wait for these parts to come in and then we'll go from there i swear get you one of these snappers because it's really really handy when you have things that you don't want to do Several days later. UPS just came and dropped off this envelope, so let's see what we have. We got a bag of 25 backup rings. That should be enough, I think. Simple as that. 
You know, there's actually room for two of these in there, but I don't know. I feel like I should probably just do one. There it is. All right. <clears throat> nice. I don't know if you've ever tried to install snap rings without the right set of snap ring pliers, but that's why I own this big set, this nice set of snap ring pliers. Let's see. Yeah, I think this will be the right one. We've got different size tips, different angles. It's got some picks. It's a pretty decent set from OTC. So this thing's on firmly. Got the snap ring installed. Perfect. Nice. And then we'll see if that fixed the leak. I'll include a link to this set of snap ring pliers in the description below. It's made by OTC, and I'm a big fan of their tools because, you know, they're pretty decent quality tools. And they're like, you know, they're, they don't have the price of like snap-on tools, but they're much better than uh, most of the stuff you'll find nowadays, much better quality. With the valve body reinstalled, let's get this thing started up and try out all the valves and see how it works. Now it's about 40 degrees outside, so it's not as cold as it was in the last video when I started it, but it still is a cold start. And also hopefully the battery will be charged this time. Horn works. Well, I thought I ran it long enough last time to fully charge the batteries, but maybe these batteries aren't very good anymore. Well, I guess I'll grab another battery and we'll try jump starting it. Yeah, they say to let this warm up a little bit at high idle. So we'll start out by testing out the stabilizers. Now, uh, you, you may note that these come up pretty slowly and they also bog the engine down as well. And I think the reason for that is because there's a needle valve in there, uh, which is needed for the pilot operated check valve to work. But uh, let's bring this one up. Actually, I'll leave them up because I want to do a little experiment and see how quickly they fall down. Now, the one on this side I replaced the seals for already. The one on this side I haven't replaced the seals yet. I do expect them both to fall down on their own though. Yeah, it 
Lights hook, everything works pretty well. I expected it to, but you know. It's always good to verify. So the only thing that I've identified, the only issue, is that there's a little bit of leaking coming from this fitting right here. And, you know, I think that's the only O-ring underneath this fitting that I didn't replace in the whole thing. So I'm going to have to do that, but that's pretty easy to do, so I'm not worried about that. I'm really glad to see everything works as intended. I'll probably have to live with a little bit of internal valve leakage here and there, but that'll be tolerable. While it doesn't feel like I accomplished that much other than replacing a few seals and o-rings, I did gain a much deeper understanding of my equipment, and that alone is worth the effort. My plan is to spend the rest of the year working on the come and swap project. There are a lot of details and challenges to get it to work, and I hope you'll enjoy the journey along with me. If you're new to the channel, you can watch the whole series in order by checking out a playlist that I've made. Thank you so much for watching, and if you have any questions or comments, let me know down below.